welcome. Uh, in this lesson, we're going to be continuing our journey through the Major Arcana, and we'll be dealing with cards number 14 and 15, the Temperance card and the Devil card. So, beginning with Temperance. From the Rider Waite Smith deck, we can see an angel crowned with a halo, and if you look very closely, you'll see the symbol of the sun just above the angel's forehead. The angel is holding two golden cups and pouring liquid backwards and forwards between the two cups. There is one foot on land and a second foot on water. So what does this mean? Temperance is one of the four cardinal virtues. And if we go back to the earliest deck I've got on the table here, uh, this is the Visconti Sforza, you'll see that's precisely what's depicted. Temperance is shown as a woman in a red and blue dress. And like the angel, you can see that she's pouring water backwards and forwards, potentially between two pictures. Or is she? If you think, think back to temperance as a cardinal virtue and how she would have been seen in this era. Temperance is the moderation of our drives, desires and our emotions. Now, the two pictures are very, very significant, as are the two colours within the dress. Uh, think back to the biblical story of Jesus turning the water into the wine. Now, in biblical times and also in sort of Renaissance times, when this card would have been drawn, wine was not necessarily uh, what we know today. Wine was uh, brewed in a much more concentrated form and would very often be watered down for consumption. So, probably, actually, if you're thinking of a modern equivalent, think of a fortified wine like uh, Ruby Port or Sherry. That's the kind of concentration that you would have you would have been faced with. So, wine would have been, in effect, tempered with water. It would have been diluted with water. Uh, now, yes, it was drunk, in its concentrated form, but actually to do so was considered to be an excess uh, and also obviously too much consumption of wine in its concentrated form would lead to, you know, severe drunkenness and all the behaviour that that entails. So, if you see temperance in her traditional form, that is one of the implications. Uh, she is potentially watering down the wine. Uh, look also at the colours that she's wearing. Red for wine, blue for water. It's the unity of those two, in inverted commas, elements. So the intoxicating effects of the concentrated wine are being tempered by the diluting effects of water. So let's look a little bit further ahead to the depiction as we see it in the Marseille tradition. And there you have it again. Uh, she's depicted as an angel this time, uh, a flower in her hair, interestingly enough. But just as with the earlier depiction, the dress is predominantly red and blue. Now, in this depiction, you can see that the her left hand side, the skirt of the dress is red, the right hand side, her right, the skirt is blue. But the implication is the same. But by sort of giving her wings, you know, the virtue has taken on a divine aspect. So you get the impression from this that obviously temperance is a divine virtue. Uh, it's a virtue blessed by God and a, virtu a divine virtue that can be sort of drawn upon in a, you know, in a spiritual way. 
So once again, she's either pouring, is she pouring uh, from one container to the other? The interesting thing is when you look at the pose, uh, it's not very realistic. You know, the water is not affected by gravity. It's sort of pouring in a very unnatural way. So I would say that there is perhaps a sort of surreal or slightly occult or something else creeping in here. You'll see as we sort of look forward to more modern representations that there is also an implication of alchemy within the Temperance card, and maybe that this is where it begins. I love this depiction. Uh, you know, the water flows against gravity, but you also have the sense, when you look at the way it's drawn, there are two interwoven strands. So you do get the sense it could be flowing backwards and forwards between the two containers. Now, the inference there is that obviously the containers represent two opposites, but if there's backwards and forward movements, those opposites in equilibrium, uh, constant movement, constant balance. So moving forward, let's have another look at another depiction. This is the one JJ. Now, the movement of the water from one vessel to another is more realistic. This is gravity dictated here. But once again, you can see the red and the blue in this, in you know, in her vestments. So it is a sort of, you know, the tempering of one liquid to another is, you know, is, is once again implied in her dress, the opposites, the water, the wine. But also let's think about red and blue in a different way. The opposites of fire and water. Water tempers fire, fire heats water. And again, we're sort of getting a little bit more towards some of the alchemical interpretations of this card as we go a little bit further forward. So we've arrived at the Golden Dawn depictions. Now within Golden Dawn decks, there are actually two temperance cards and you get to choose which one you want. So. Let's look at the first one. It's more traditional in that you can see the angel with the two pictures. Uh, it's unrealistic. Again, the liquid flows backwards and forwards rather than, you know, it, it's gravity defying. But here you can very distinctly see the two streams, uh, one white, one red. So potentially water, potentially wine, but Again, that's ambiguous. Now, this temperance angel is very distinctly crowned by the sun. Now, she also has a yellow square on her breast. So I would take that to be sun energy as well. Uh, she is standing one foot on land, one foot on water. And... You can also see that actually at her feet is a bow and arrow. The arrow is pointing straight upwards. It's actually, this temperance angel has four feet. Now, one pair of these feet is actually drawing the string on the bow. Now, the bow is actually a rainbow arc. So the arrow ties this into the sign of Sagittarius, which is actually one of the traditional astrological uh, correspondences for this card. But the rainbow is very important and we'll see as we move on to the Rider weight card why that is. But yeah, this is this is very much in the vein. Ah, now look at that. One vessel is red, the other is blue. So fire, water, water, wine. But it's again, it's the balance and the equilibrium of the two that we can see. Let's look at the other alternate temperance card. Now, this really does take us into the realm of the elements and to alchemy and fire and water. This is slightly different. You can see a crowned, almost naked woman presiding over a cauldron. And in one hand, she's pouring water from a chalice. In the other hand, she has a firebrand. Now, 
Below the water chalice is a fiery lion. Below the firebrand is a watery eagle. So, in effect, she is tempering the eagle with fire and she's tempering the lion with water. Uh, water in the cauldron, fire beneath the cauldron. This is, we really are into the realms of alchemy now, uh, sort of the, you know, the mythical elemental reactions within the tradition of alchemy. This is the reconciliation of opposites, fire and water. Okay, so let's go back to that rainbow in the first temperance card. And even though we don't see a rainbow in the Rider weight, we do see a symbol that actually explains the presence of the rainbow. The temperance angel in many of these modern traditions can be associated with the goddess Iris from Greek mythology. Now, she was the goddess of the rainbow. There is no rainbow in this card, but as you'll see behind the angel on the banks of the pool are yellow flag irises, the flower of the goddess. So once again, with this card, you can see one foot on land, one foot in the water. A triangle of fire on the angel's breast and the angel is crowned with the sun. Now, one tiny detail, uh, if you have your Rider Waite deck to hand while you're watching this lesson, look very closely. Just above the fire triangle in the angel's vestments, if you look at the folds of those vestments, concealed within them is the Hebrew letters for the, the name of God, Yahweh. So this is a divinely sent messenger, angel messenger, and the cardinal virtue is very much a divine virtue in this. So the angel of temperance, and you can see that the sunrise in this card actually implies a golden crown. So mastery of the art of temperance actually brings rule and control over the physical realm. Okay, so what of the rainbow and the goddess? Iris was the messenger. She was one of the divine messengers, I think Zeus's divine messenger. She was sent down into the underworld to collect water from the river Styx in her golden goblet and take it back to the heavens. So the rainbow was sometimes seen as her bridge. This is a depiction from the mythic tarot, which actually shows temperance as the goddess. And you can see the rainbow in this card. But what has that got to do with the, with the cardinal virtue? Well, water from the underworld being raised up to the overworld, to the gods. It's the connection of the above with the below. So again, once again, it's the, the inference of the goddess Iris is, is the unification of opposites. And that's what this card is all about, okay? Just two other depictions before we sort of look at this overall. Here's the Thoth card. Now this is very much based on the second Golden Dawn depiction. This is the sort of alchemical reconciliation of fire and water. The attempt to blend fire and water and to merge them. So the figure here actually has, depicts more and more opposites as well. Uh, you've got obviously the cauldron. Uh, she's holding fire in one hand, water in the other. Uh, you see again the eagle and the angel, but look at this. The it's the uh, not the, the eagle and the angel, the lion and the eagle. Sorry, pardon me. Uh, look at the lion. The lion is watery in colour, whereas the eagle is fiery in colour. So you have this unification of opposites in this card. The female figure has two faces: one dark, one light. And 
she's pouring fire and water together to blend them in the cauldron. Very, very powerful. Oh, one more. In the Heindel deck, the card is actually renamed Alchemy. Now, this is much more abstract, but you can see that the top left of the image is watery, the bottom right is fiery. And there's certain elements in this card, when you look at it closely, that cross over and unify the two. OK. So what is temperance? In personal terms for us, if this card appears in a reading, it denotes that internal balance. If we're able to balance and unify the most extremes of our, you know, of our drives and our instincts, uh, if we can temper our greatest passions, you know, with moderation and, you know, sort of we can bring them under control, we can make them work for us. Temperance is, it's not just a balance, it's an equilibrium. It's, you know, it's when there is a healthy flow of our emotions and our passions and our drives. Uh, you know, it's, they're very much in motion, but in a sort of motion that is balanced, that isn't too extreme. Temperance is the middle path. It's the path between passion and restraint. It's the path between, you know, the fieriness of our drives and our emotions and the cooling, the cooling nature of our, maybe of our more intuitive instincts. You know, we don't let our passions run wild. We sense what's going on around us and we, we rein our passions in accordingly. I don't know whether that's the best explanation. But when temperance is applied to our lives, we can find that middle ground. We're not too cold, we're not too hot. Uh, we, we remain passionate and feeling, but in control, able to navigate rationally, you know, despite the power of our instincts and our emotions. So when this appears in a reading, temperance actually calls for restraint, calls for moderation. It shows if it's residing over other cards, it shows that we're in that environment where we are ruled by this principle or we need to draw on it. If it's reversed, this takes us into the realm of excess. You know, this is where our passions swing from one extreme of the pendulum to the other. Uh, it's where we're ruled by our passions, uh, where we lose rationality because we let our passions take over. And we'll see that very much in the next card. Temperance allows us to feel and to enjoy all of our passions, but it, it it means that we can enjoy them and experience them from a controlled perspective. So, when we get into the realm of the next card, we actually begin to see something of what happens with an absence of temperance. But then I think this next card goes so much deeper. We're into the realms of card number 15, the devil. So let's have a look at the image. We see the darkest image from our Western mythology, the demonic devil, the winged obscenity, uh, bat wings, horns, uh, the lower part of his body is possibly a goat. The upper part is human. Uh, he is perched on a black pillar. Now, chained to this pillar, you can see a man and a woman. Uh, the chains sit round their neck and they're tied to the pillar that the devil sits on. Now, if this image looks slightly familiar, 
It's for more than one reason. Let's go back to the Lovers card in the Rider Waite deck. Now look at that. Here's the Lovers and you can see the man and the woman resided over by the angel. Here, the man and the woman are resided over by a demonic force. This is the counterpart of the Lovers. The Lovers was free will and choice. This is the opposite of that. This is entrapment and the loss of will. So look on this Rider weight depiction, look between the horns of the devil. You can see that there is an inverted pentagram. Now, we've already mentioned the pentagram as obviously the upright pentagram is the symbol that we see on the traditional pentacles within the tarot. Now, in its inverted form here, the pentagram upright can represent the human body. So think of the head, the outstretched arms, the outstretched legs forming a star. So in its inverted form here, when it's upright, the head rules the body. But here, you can see with it inverted, if you think of it as a human map, the genitalia would be the low point between those two upright points. So in its inverted form, as a map of the human body, the genitals are actually in a ruling place. So foisted onto the head of the devil, that shows that in human forms, the passions and the physical appetites have taken over. So in effect, this devil, this demon is a stereotype of human appetites gone amok. And you can see the man and the woman actually who have become demons themselves. They've sprouted horns and tails. They are tied to the appetites that are actually depicted here. You can see this especially in their tails. Look at the devil's left hand. He has a flaming torch which is held down to the man's tail. So the man's tail is set alight. So basically that tail symbolises that this man is so inflamed with his passions and his appetites that he's basically completely given over to them. The woman's tail is more interesting. If the male figure represents passions out of control, the female figure here represents narcissism and inward looking. If you look, the tail ends with a bunch of grapes that she's actually feeding off. So in effect, she's feeding off herself. Her perceptions are completely turned inward. Her appetites are completely turned inward. Now, ultimately, that leads to self-consumption and self-destruction. So whereas we had the appetites and the emotions tempered and in control, here they are completely out of control. So you could say that temperance reversed, although not this extreme, is leading towards this. You know, if temperance reversed is the emotions and the appetites off balance, this next card shows where it leads. OK. So let's have a look at some of our other depictions. Actually, they're mostly similar. You can see in this Visconti deck. It's difficult to say whether the devil would have looked like this in this deck because the, the original card is missing. But this reconstruction actually shows a similar image. You know, you can see the demon. You can see the two human figures becoming demonized and actually chained to the devil's platform. You see the same thing again in the Marseille card. And also in this Golden Dawn depiction, very similar. The 1JJ is interesting because it just shows a demon standing over a grief-stricken woman. Her head is in her hands. 
So not only is there entrapment involved here, but you also see someone who is ruled by their fears, which is another part of the devil card. You know, not only do appetites take control, but fears and insecurities take control as well. Everything that's represented by the dark side of us. The fourth card actually really does show sexual appetite out of control because the devil is actually depicted as a goat. Now, if you look at this, the goat actually is suspended in front of a giant phallus. You can see implied a penis and testicles. If you look at the testicles, they also show a picture of cell division. Each one represents a single cell. Now, if you know anything about how DNA divides within a single cell in preparation for cell division, that is exactly what Crowley was asking Frida Harris to denote. But you can you can see the sort of spindle frame that the the genes polarize and separate out onto before the cell splits. But also within that cell, you can see these ghostly human figures showing the sort of almost like a prophetic forerunner of life. But this, in effect, the goat represents the urge and the sexual drive gone completely wild. So, so if we pull this card in a reading, I mean, it's, it's one of those cards that everyone fears, like the next card that we'll look at, the Tower, the Ten of Swords, the Death card. You know, there's so much superstition around this card. But actually, it doesn't represent the devil literally, but it does represent our dark aspect and how we can become enslaved to that dark aspect. This is when all of the cardinal virtues are abandoned and we literally just listen to our instincts, listen to our, our bodily appetites, listen to our desires and indulge them. What actually happens is we become enslaved to them and then they control us, they diminish us. And that's very much what you see here. One of the things that was pointed out to me quite early on was that if you look at the chains, particularly on this rider weight depiction, they hang very loosely around the necks of the two human figures. If they chose to, they could literally lift these chains off. They could walk away. But actually, a lot of the time when we're enslaved to our passions and to our desires, and we get into that overindulgence cycle, we're there of our own choice. But the further down that path we go, the more difficult it is to turn back. So, one other interesting little detail here. If you look at the devil's upright palm, you can see that there's almost like a symbol etched into his hand. Now, it doesn't make much sense until you follow that symbol round and then you also take in, into account the shape of the thumb. And so what you're doing is you're actually, you're following that line and then it goes down, it goes up and round the thumb. And actually when you look closely, that's the symbol of Saturn. So if you think of Saturn as the bringer of old age, it's what's implied here is weakness, restriction, decay, but they're all the things that are implied when we are given over wholly to our passions, our insecurities, our fears, our appetites. The more we become enslaved, the more we become diminished. The less freedom we experience, the smaller and narrower our world gets. Think drug addiction. You become enslaved to the substance to the point where the substance literally looms virtually 100% over your life. Your life becomes the next fix. That's very much what we see here. So if this appears in a reading, I would say look at anything in your own life that is controlling you rather than you being in control of it. Look to your fears and how they're controlling you. 
uh, ask questions of yourself and of your appetites. Uh, are you in control or are they controlling you? What is binding, restricting or limiting you in your journey? Because actually, ultimately, this is the ultimate card of limitation and constriction. Whereas we see the freedom and the joy implied in the lover's card. This is joyless. This is anguish ridden. This is fear ridden. Uh, this is what it's like to be in chains. This is enslavement. Reversed. What can we say? Breaking free, perhaps? You've turned the devil on his head. I think the key element of the reverse devil is that the pentagram turns upright again. So with this is reversed, maybe you're beginning to take back control. You're beginning to push back against the unbridled appetite. So there you have it. Thanks for watching. I hope this has made sense. I think there's a lot in these two cards and I'm aware that I've kind of bungled my way through with my own instinctive take on these cards. It's not the final word. Hopefully from everything that I've said, I'll have given you something that you'll be able to use as a springboard to begin to explore these two archetypes yourselves. I hope it's been helpful. Thanks for watching and I hope you'll join me for our next lesson, which is going to deal with cards number 16 and 17, the tower and the star. See you next time. If you've enjoyed this lesson and found it helpful, please hit the like button, share it with your friends and subscribe to my channel to find out when I share new videos or go live. You can also find me on Instagram at Chris Butler Artist, on Twitter at Butler Tarot and on Facebook at The Sacred Tarot. Thanks for watching and see you next time.